Zoe's time was 28 hours, 45 minutes. Zoe has multiple sclerosis. She walked the entire route with a back brace, knee braces, and crutches, but she finished the New York City Marathon. In fact, she has now finished the New York City Marathon more than two dozen times, and, and she actually now holds the, the record for uh, longest time for the New York City Marathon. And as I think about her and what she has done, it reminds me that our Lord did not tell us to go and, and teach the gospel to the world around us when it is easy, when we have time, when society favors us. That, that's not it at all. But in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In John 16 and verse 33, as he spoke to his apostles, Jesus reminded them there would be obstacles. He said, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. He said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And friends, the fact of the matter is we will have obstacles. There are obstacles in becoming a Christian. There are obstacles in living the Christian life. There are obstacles in teaching lost souls and in doing the work that the Lord has given us to do. And the question that comes to me, the question that comes to you becomes what are we going to do with those obstacles that come our way? And as we open our Bible this evening to Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, we find a question that is asked of the people of Israel in the Old Testament. There in Haggai chapter 1, God's people had been given a work by God. Those who returned from Babylonian captivity began the work immediately of, of rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians when the Babylonians had destroyed the, the city and, and the temple. And as we look at the people of Israel and what they did in rebuilding the temple, they got started on it, but then they stopped in their work for God. And God sent a prophet. He sent Haggai to them to tell them, it's time to get started in God's work again. It's time to get to the work that God had given them to do. And so I want you to notice first with me what we find in Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, seeing the people of Israel, and then I want us to learn some lessons from them as we close out our sermon tonight. So first, let's open our Bible to Haggai chapter 1. Here we see the people of Israel in the Old Testament, and we see first their neglected work 536 years before Christ the, the first group of, of Jewish people returned from Babylonian captivity they returned to Judea they returned to Jerusalem and one of the very first actions that they undertook when they came back out of captivity was that they had begun rebuilding that temple in Jerusalem Ezra writes about that in the book that bears his name they were going to restore the worship of God they were going to make sure that, that they had things in order so they they could, could come before God's throne, unfortunately. Once the foundation of that temple had been built in Jerusalem, the people stopped their work. They were deeply discouraged. They were under a great deal of criticism. And so they began to go about their own lives. And, and God's temple lay unfinished. They, they started it. They built the foundation. But, but then they stopped. Then in 520 B.C., 600, oh, 600, 16 years after they had begun the work on that temple, it was then that the prophet Haggai began to speak to the people, speaking God's message to encourage them to rebuild the temple. And we see that message beginning in Haggai chapter 1, verse 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Haggai immediately after 16 years of that, that foundation of the temple laying bare, Haggai now comes with the word of God saying, you're still saying it's not time to build the temple. You're still saying it's not time to get busy, to get involved, to get engaged in God's work. The neglected work 
is the first thing that we see there in Haggai chapter 1. But then in the second place, as we look at Haggai chapter 1, we see the people of Israel, we see their nonchalant attitude. The people had decided it was not time to build God's house, but it's not that, that they sat back and did nothing. It's not that they said, well, we can't build God's house, so we may as well just sort of set up our tents out here and, and wait until we think the time has come. But in Haggai chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, notice what we read. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple lie in ruin? Haggai was doing, dealing with the problem of studied indifference. The, the people of God there had, had returned from captivity. They, they built the foundation of the temple with great fervor, with a great desire to return to the worship of God. But because there was opposition from some of the people in the land, they had left off of that. Now 16 years have passed and God's house was left in ruins, a bare foundation but the people had been busy building up their own houses and not just a, a simple dwelling place. The description given here by Haggai, is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses? It, it was a finished house, a, a decorated house. It, it's ornate, it's comfortable. And so the people had built the houses for themselves, but, but had left the temple alone. And basically it was the idea that said, I'm fine. <laughs> My family is fine. We're all doing very well. Thank you very much. We've taken care of our own. And regarding the temple, regarding the house of God, essentially their question was, what is that to me? I have a house. My family is warm. My family is dry. Why should I be concerned about the house of God? It was a nonchalant attitude. And so the prophet Haggai then brings them to the third part of this, which is their necessary self-examination. Look with me at Haggai chapter 1 and verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. He's saying, I want you to think about what you've done. I don't know if you ever heard that when you were growing up or maybe you said something along the, those lines to your children when they said or did something they should not have done, but you tell them you want them to sit down and, and think about what they've done. I want you to think about what you've said and, and we want there to be some reflection and that is exactly what God is doing with His people in the Old Testament. Consider your ways. Think about what you have done. Verse 6, you have sown much and you bring in little. You don't have enough, even though you are eating. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it into a, a bag with holes. I don't know if you ever felt that way. That you got your check and, and you put it in the bank and, and you turn around and the money's gone. But, but that was the problem for the people of Israel. They earned their wages, they put it into a bag and the money was just gone. It's like it was a bag with holes. And then in verse 7, he repeats himself and he says... Consider your ways. For all of the obstacles that the people of Israel face, the outside interference from the people around them, and they did have outside interference. The Samaritans who had come into the land boldly opposed them and in fact threatened them saying if you go on and continue building this temple we're, we're going to find a way to get you in trouble with the Persian Empire. They, they did have some trouble, some interference. They did have a difficult work because that kind of labor is is hard labor. It is back-breaking labor and, and so it was a difficult work in front of them. But the bottom line that Haggai is addressing is the problem that they had of indifference towards spiritual matters. They were deeply concerned about their own house, about their own wealth, about making sure they had what they wanted, but they were not concerned about the temple. They were not concerned about the house of God. And so God's message through the prophet was, consider your ways. So the prophet said, it is time. 
It is time, whatever the obstacles are, whatever the, the, the walls are in front of you, it is time for you to get busy in the work that God has given you to do. And as we this afternoon are sitting here and we're opening our Bibles to Haggai chapter 1, I want us to realize the same message comes to me and it comes to you. God says to us, it's time. It's time to get busy in my work. It's time to do the things that, that I've told you to do. And we might be able to sit back like the people of Israel and say, but you know, there, there are obstacles in front of us. There are things that, that are keeping us from doing these things that God told us to do. We can say that. They could too. And yet the prophet's message was still, consider your ways. Is it time for you to live comfortably? without doing the will of God. So what do we need to do? It's time for me and you to be busy in the work of the Lord. It's time for us to overcome those obstacles that so often stop us. We need to overcome the obstacle of fear. In so many instances, when it comes to doing the will of God, it simply is fear that gets in the way, isn't it? Especially when it comes to Evangelism. When it comes to teaching someone the gospel, we are concerned about things. How is this going to go? What, what might happen? One person might say, you know, what if I ask somebody to, to study the Bible with me? What if I invite someone to worship services and I say, won't you come and, and sit with me on Sunday? I want, you to, I want you to sit with me and worship. I want to be able to talk about some of these things with you. What if I ask them and they say no? I don't want to be callous about this. But so what? What if they do say no? How has that harmed us? What has that taken away from us? If we invite someone and ask someone to services or we ask someone to study the Bible and, and they say no, we say, well, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm going to ask you again one day. I hope one day I get a different answer from you. But don't let it stop us. Don't let fear get in the way. Another person says, well, you know, what if, what if I try to teach someone and, and I get into a Bible study with this person and I do the best I can. I treat the Word of God with, with integrity to the very best of my ability. I, I use the knowledge that I have. But, but one day years later, what if I look back on that and I say, you know, I could have done a better job with that. My answer is join the club. I have people sometimes who ask me, you know, after you've been preaching 30 years, do you look back and, and, and take some of those sermons from when you first started preaching and preach them? No. No, I do not. I look at most of those sermons and I think, boy, that was a great effort. But I had a long way to go. And I hope in five years, I look at the sermons I'm preaching now and I say, you know, that was a great effort. But I've grown, I've matured, I've moved forward. I want every one of us to be growing in the Lord so that we do the very best we can with what we have right now. And one day we look back at it and say, oh, that was so cute, but I'm glad I've grown beyond that. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't let it be a fear that keeps you from doing the will of God. Some people in their fear. They say, what if I'm in a Bible study and somebody asks me a question I can't answer? That's probably one of the biggest fears we face. If I'm in a Bible study, they might ask me something I can't answer it. I, I don't know what to do with that. Here's what you do. Rejoice in it. Because that's an open door. Because if they ask you a question and you, you're not sure what the Bible says about that, say to them, what I try to do is let the Bible do the speaking. And I want to give a biblical answer to the question you've asked. And there are some things I need to study on that. There are some things I want to make sure I've got right so that when I answer this, I'm giving you the answer from the Bible. So how about next Monday at 7 o'clock in the evening or next Tuesday at 7.30 in the evening, we sit down and study this after I've had an opportunity to look it up and make sure, you know what you've done there? You've guaranteed your next Bible study with this person. 
Don't let the question scare you off. Don't let fear keep you from doing the will of God. In Psalm 46, beginning with verse 1, we get a wonderful message in the book of Psalms. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth is removed and though the mountains are, are carried into the midst of the sea. God is the one on whom we lean. Don't let fear stop you. It's time, brethren. It's time for us to overcome fear. But not only that, it is time for us to overcome procrastination. Maybe this one's a little bit closer to home for us when it comes to doing the Lord's work. We know what the Lord wants us to do. We know that He wants us to, to live His way. We, we know that He wants us to to do the best we can to get the doors open, to, to open opportunities, to bring people, uh, to get them into services, to get them into a Bible study. And we understand that very well. We know that there are lost souls around us and our Lord wants us to, to do the very best that we can to bring them to Christ. But we put it off. We decide, you know, one, one day, somewhere down the line, that's when I'll do it, not... Not right now. Right now I'm busy. Right now it's just not the right time. Right now it's, it's just not when I think it would be best. And so we put it off to, to a future that is unknown to every one of us. That procrastination. And I say this as someone who does have areas of his life in which I, I struggle with procrastination. Procrastination ultimately is terribly prideful because it's assuming a future that you and I just do not know. We need to make sure we're doing the Lord's will in the time that we've been given. Opening our Bibles to John chapter 4 and verse 35, we find there the words of Jesus to his apostles. This is, this is when Jesus was speaking to the woman at the well in Samaria. And he had spoken to that woman. She had gone running into the city. The disciples had not been part of that discussion. They just see the woman going into the city. And, and now Jesus is there. And they're talking to Jesus. And Jesus seeing the city. And more likely than not, given the time of day, you're, you're seeing people of the city moving out and about. Jesus says to the disciples, do you not say... There are still four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are already white to harvest. He probably was indicating the city of Samaria and all of the souls, all of the people who, who were bustling about in that city. Jesus is probably indicating that and saying, there is your field. That is where the work is. Can't the same thing be said for me and you? Portland needs the gospel. Our area needs to hear the, the word of God. They, they need to hear it from me and from you, from people who are concerned for their souls. Let's not put it all. In Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 9, we find the message that he who is slothful in his work is brother to him who is a great destroyer. Think about that for a moment. That the one who is slothful, the one who is lazy in his approach to the work is, is like the one who's actively harming it. The one who is destroying in what he does because the work's still not getting done. And that's why it is time for us to overcome number one, fear. And number two, procrastination. And then number three, brethren, it is time for us to overcome a lack of faith. How many times do we see our work for the Lord, the, the work of the church, slowly coming to a halt under the assault of the phrase, it won't do any good. How many times have we thought about a, a particular person that, that we would like to see at, at services a, a, and we want to have that opportunity to open the door to teach the gospel. Someone with whom we'd like to have a Bible study or maybe it's someone who has fallen away from the Lord and we're deeply concerned about their soul and we think, I, I'd like to say something to them. 
But it won't do any good. And so we don't. Because we decided what God has provided in His Word isn't sufficient. The way that God has told us to handle these situations just won't work. And it's interesting to me as a preacher. I've, I've been the local preacher in four congregations, but, but I've had opportunity to preach in, in several different places, whether in a meeting or a lectureship or a summer series. And one of the phrases that, that I hear a lot, and, and in so many different towns, different cities, different states, people will say, well, people around here just aren't that receptive to the gospel. And what it is, is we decide that, that our community is kind of closed off to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not interested in the gospel. And so well, there's really not much point in, in taking the gospel to the community. It's a lack of faith. And, and the result of that is, is that we then become very inward focused. But when we decide that it won't do any good to get the word of God to our community, to find ways to open the doors, to, to get people in, to, to let them see who we are so, so that they can see that we care about them, that we love them, and, and maybe that will open the door to a study. Instead of doing those things, we become inward focused. We, we concentrate on ourselves. And things become about our convenience, about our comfort, about our desires and it creates a twisted and and biblically incorrect view that that says we are the customers and the church exists to meet our needs it forgets the fact that we are the church and we've been given a work by our lord we need to reawaken our faith in romans chapter 10 and verse 17 we're told so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to get back to the basics. We need to wake up our faith. We need to strengthen our faith. We need to grow our faith. Opening the pages of the Bible. To study it. To, to see what is there. And, and not just studying it so that we have an, an intellectual knowledge of it. But studying it. Seeing what is there. And putting it to work in our life. So that we're living it. So that we're following it. And as we study, as we apply the scriptures, we pray. We go before the throne of God, praying that we follow Jesus as the scriptures teach, praying that, that we'll be able to be a light in the world around us, that others will see Christ in us, that that light of Christ will draw souls and we start opening doors. It's time for us to overcome that lack of faith. We know that the Lord has given us a work to do. And we can do that work. We can invite our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. Invite them to services and invite them to have a Bible study. We can find opportunities to get to know more and more people in the community. I know for those of you who have lived in Portland most or all of your lives, the town's changed. Nashville has grown outward and, and, and you can see some of that. There are a lot of people around that, that, that you might look around and you might say, I don't even know what they're doing here because they, they work that far away. Why are they here in Portland? Whatever their reason is, they're a precious soul who needs the gospel of Christ. And maybe it's not someone that you grew up with. Maybe it's not someone whose family is, is a known piece in the community but it's someone who needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can invite them. We can study with the people around us. We can get to know more and more people to open those doors, to bring souls to Jesus Christ. Our Lord has given us what we need to accomplish His will. He's given us His Word, the Bible, so that we can use this to, to teach lost souls so that they can come to see Jesus through His Word. This, by the way, is also the food that allows me and you to keep growing in Jesus Christ. He's given us the gift of prayer so that we can come before His throne, to, to come before Him to, to pray about those things that we're planning, that we want to do to bring souls to Christ, that we want to do to, to help people to come to see Jesus so that we can pray to Him when we're struggling, when we're having difficulties. He's given us prayer. He's given us the church, a fellowship, the family of God, so we can lean on each other 
and rely on one another, knowing full well that our talents and abilities are different and where one person may shine in one area, they may recognize I need to pull in brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so to help me with this part of the work because they're better at this than I am. We can turn to one another. Whether it's a success or a failure, when we reach out to some lost soul, and we can put our arms around each other and recognize that we're doing the best that we can to do the Lord's will. Our Lord has given us the church to help us. We look around, we find that there are lost souls around us and we know what they need. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul put it this way. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek, I am really glad for Romans 1.16. Because I'm not the power to save. I'm not sufficient for that. I, I can't handle that kind of pressure. But the gospel is God's power to save. It can do what it's supposed to do. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 reminds us, in Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. I'm glad for that passage because it tells me that what saves a person is not me. It's not how great I am or how wonderful I can try to be. What saves a person is the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross. And what you and I need to do is to get the gospel to them, to bring them to Jesus, to get them to that blood, to be saved by His blood so that they can become our brothers and sisters and we together can grow in the Lord. It begins with Jesus. That's, that's always our beginning point. And this, this evening, that's the beginning point for you. If you have not come to Christ, to be buried with Him in baptism for the remission of your sins, that's where you need to begin. You need to start with Jesus. Come to Him as, as the Scriptures teach, hearing the Word believe. Repent of your sins and confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. and Be buried with Him in baptism for the remission of your sins. When you do that, your sins are washed away. You become a Christian. You become a child of God. Then as a Christian, be faithful. Continue to follow Jesus. Walk in Him recognizing that we, the church, have a work to do. There, there is a mission that has been placed into our hands and that mission is outside of the walls of this building. That mission is souls. And let's work together to get Christ to them, to get the gospel to them so that those souls can come to our Lord. If you as a child of God haven't been faithful, then come home. One of the great blessings of the Bible is, is that the Lord has said He is forgiving and that if one should fall away from following Him, that, that He's waiting with open arms that we can come back to Him and you can do that if that's where you are. But won't you start in the right place? Won't you start with Jesus right now as we stand and as we sing? Just as I am.
610 will be our last number. If you've not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, he's prepared back in room 8. You can leave out either of the doors. There'll be someone back there to assist you. Next question, does anybody know this song? Okay, we have four. That's good. <clears throat> this is my day.